Well, hello there, Anxious Cynic back again with another Minimator tutorial. And in this video, we're going to be covering how to pick up and drop and throw items, things like that. And I went ahead and created this little preview animation here to basically give a really quick overview of all the steps that goes into making an animation like this. So let's go ahead and watch my award-winning animation here. And I'll go over the steps to make it. And then I'll show you an alternative because this uses parenting. And a lot of people are wondering if there's another way to do this. And we'll cover that afterwards. So let's go ahead and hit play. And there you have it, simple as that. In this animation, I have Steve, of course, running up to the sword that's uh, Excalibur in the stone. He grabs it, pulls it out, tosses it up, lands back in his hand, a little bit of a reaction there. Looks forward, he's just gonna toss it for no reason. Sword spins and lands in the ground, of course. So basically, this is the traditional method of parenting an item to a character. So what we have here is two swords. The sword is duplicated. There's one already parented to Steve, and then I have a second sword that is the initial one we see here. So basically, you're gonna have two separate items. One is the one that's parented, one is the one that's not parented, and then you control the visibility over here of those items in order to mimic him picking it up. So if you look over here, let's zoom in on our timeline. Right here at this moment, you can see that the sword in his hand is not visible. The first keyframe here set for that sword has the visibility toggled off. And then when we get to where he picks it up, the visibility is toggled on. And the reverse is true for the sword that's in the ground already. So there's a couple of keyframes here because I animated it to move a little bit when his hand touches it. But as you can see, when we hit this keyframe, it goes invisible. So basically it's very simple. You take the item that you have on the ground and let's see if we uh, go ahead and just make this visible again. All you do is you take the one that's on the ground and that is kind of, uh, you know, your base marker for the pose of that item. And then the one that's in the hand at this point, you have it positioned in exactly the same way. It doesn't have to be 100% perfect, but uh, you know, close enough. It happens so quickly. You can see here that they're not like perfectly lined up. You'll see that, you know, just kind of roughly getting it into the same position. It happens so fast. Chances are no one's going to notice that they're not 100% perfectly aligned, but you do want it to be as close as possible. So basically what happens then is uh, this one becomes invisible right at the moment, the same frame that the one in the parented position becomes visible. And then we get this illusion that Steve has picked up the sword and brought it out of the ground. There's no animation for him like struggling to pull it or anything because that's how strong Steve is. The dude can punch trees so you know it's realistic. In any case this is the parented sword that I just animated to pop up out of his hand and spin around so you don't actually have to do this step for every occasion. This one I actually just used the one that's parented and animated it separately out of his hand and then back down into his hand. All right, so moving further down the timeline here, we basically have the exact same thing happening, but in the reverse. So when Steve goes to throw it, I chose this frame here. I felt like this is where it should probably leave his hand. So there, our second sword, the one that's not parented, becomes visible again. The one in his hand becomes invisible. Okay, so a question that I get asked is, is there a way to do this without the parenting method, without having to create the duplicate swords or whatever the item is gonna be? And not really. There is kind of a hack way to do it that I found. Personally, I'm not quite sure if I like it, but I figured if you guys wanna experiment with it, I'll just show you what I was able to uncover. So uh, we're gonna go up here and we're gonna create a path. Let's go ahead and create that and it just puts the empty path into our scene. If you watch my path tutorial, then you know how this all works. What we're gonna do is create a point and we're gonna take this path and we're gonna parent it. I can either uh, drag it up in here or go over here to the hierarchy. Let's just do like this and let's put on the left arm. So there's our path and uh, I'm just gonna, it doesn't really matter. I'm just gonna try to line it up more or less with Steve's hand because that's typically how he grabs things. I don't know if you, you know, maybe he would grab things with his elbow. So we've got our uh, path there and what we can do, let's see if we can just spawn in another item. Let's say Steve is gonna uh, dual wield his diamond sword with a wooden shovel, zero out the position 
if I can click on the right thing, there we go. So what I'm gonna do now is apply a constraint. So if with the shovel selected, we have constraints. And again, if you watch my path tutorial, then you know all about this. If I do this and go to path, click it, nothing happens. The reason for that is for paths to work, there needs to be two points in order to constrain it because the item, I guess, is looking for a point A and point B to be constrained to because of how paths work. I don't know, I'm not a rocket surgeon. I'm gonna add another path point. When I do that, when we have two points, and if I go to the path here, you'll see we have two path points. So with that, then the constraint works. Let's grab our shovel and you'll see that the shovel is now indeed constrained to that path. Steve's holding the shovel now and it is doing so because it is constrained. If I show this keyframe here, we are set to the path on the timeline constraint. And when Steve runs, he's holding the, the shovel and he's doing his thing. So let's say we want him to drop the shovel here. And uh, I'm not gonna show like the whole animation of like dropping it and picking it up. Hopefully you guys can uh, figure that out for yourselves. But uh, at this point, let's say we want him to drop the shovel. So what I'm gonna do, take off the constraint. I set a keyframe. We're gonna go to the path and put it on none. So you can see now that it is no longer constrained and it just plopped back down here and it's plopping back down to whatever the position value is here. So what we want to happen is on this keyframe where we have unconstrained it, we want to match up the position of this to where it was. So this is going to be a little bit trial and error. You're going to have to uh, kind of go back and forth a little bit. And as you can see there, it's kind of uh, disappearing. So we don't want that to be happening. <laughs> you can see that it's kind of moving and that's probably because this is a keyframe here. The first one is set to linear. So if we put it on instant, we do like so, it's not gonna move and then you can see it suddenly just changes position. So that's something to keep in mind. Obviously you can animate this in between, but the keyframe, let's say if we had the, the shovel moving just for no good reason. Let's uh, set that linear. Let's just say we want it sliding down his arm for some reason. So it's gonna be sliding down his arm and then we want the next keyframe to uh, be instant when we go to detach it. Hopefully that makes sense. Kind of butchered it, but uh, play around with it. You'll figure it out. You're smart, I hope. So we've got our instant keyframe transition. Here's the one we want it to let go. And what we're gonna do is just plop back and forth between these two keyframes here. What we want is to mimic that position. And since we're not using duplicates, we can't really see where our other position was. So we're going to have to kind of, you know, finagle this thing. Close enough. So there you go. So now it has detached and the, the shovel was close enough. We probably aren't going to see any problems. And I just want to animate, maybe it, it falls down to the ground. So here, I'm going to put another keyframe. And for this keyframe, once it's detached, let's just put a little uh, bounce animation. And then back on this keyframe here, we're just going to drag this thing down. And then, so what we end up having is Steve runs up, drops the shovel, and then does his thing. We can take Steve at this point uh, let's grab an actual Steve, move him around. You'll see the shovel is no longer following Steve's position. And we didn't have to create another object. We didn't have to duplicate the shovel in order to do that. I'm just going to throw a little animation on here because I don't like the way it's stuck into the ground like that. So it's going to eh, like so. And then we're going to eh, like that. Okay. Boop, boop. And then it falls over. Oh, that's on instant. Let's get rid of that and bounce a little bit. Oh, that's, that's a little too fast. I'm just having a little fun right here. Just get, bear with me for a second. There we go. That's terrible. So anyway, that's the, uh, the, the basic idea there. Personally, I think the duplicating items is probably the better way to do it because you basically are doing the same process here, but you don't have the second item as a reference to line things up but if for whatever reason you don't want to create a duplicate maybe you're trying to keep the number of items in your scene low so that your computer doesn't blow up or something like that 
then uh, this could be a viable method. It's a little bit janky, but uh, there you go. That That's uh, a way to do it. And so there you have it, guys. That's uh, two different ways to parent and have Steve interact with objects and items. Uh, pick your poison. Do duplicates and use parenting or use this weird path hack constraint method and, uh, you know, let the creativity flow or don't. I don't care. <laughs>